So. All right, hi away. everyone. Um, really looking forward to talking with you all and telling you a bit about the work that I've been doing, developing clinical reasoning in the anatomy laboratory. So my name is Kara Sandholt. I am assistant adjunct faculty at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. I have been teaching anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology for over 13 years at various institutions in the Northern California region. I've taught community college, I've taught undergraduate, and I've been at the School of Nursing at UC Davis for about six years now. So what we will talk about today is um, how I've been using virtual anatomy and anatomy lab active learning sessions to encourage clinical reasoning for our students, which are physician assistant and nurse practitioner students. And I will also at the end, if we have time, outline some of the educational scholarship endeavors that um, I have started to explore the student experiences and perceptions of this newly developed clinical anatomy curriculum. So this is a photograph of one of our groups of students a few years ago. This was actually uh, what we used to call Aloha Thursday. So of course, this was pre-COVID. Uh, we had a number of members of this cohort that were from Hawaii. Um, and so this that particular year, they started Aloha Thursdays, and we all used to wear our uh, Aloha shirts. So this is our group. Um, this is our a nurse practitioner and physician assistant class. We have a class of about 75 to 85 students in any given cohort. Um, it is a 27 month clinical program for our physician assistants and a little bit shorter for our nurse practitioners. They work together in diverse and interprofessional coursework um, where we have one year of didactic coursework and a second year of clinical rotations in the program. My teaching is focused in the first year because being a scientist, I help them with their anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, and we integrate it through their primary care medicine course in the first year of their program. So I teach this four quarter series with a faculty team. It's a one year series. Um, myself and my teaching partner put together the anatomy, physiology, and basic sciences pathophysiology connections that outline the foundations for the course. And then we have other instructors that teach primary care medicine, uh, clinical assessment, diagnosis, um, weave throughout the course as well. So it's very important to us as we teach this course that all of the basic sciences are applied to the medicine they're learning. The students are taking the medicine at the same time. Um, and so they have a tendency to ignore the basic sciences that don't directly relate to the medicine that they're learning. Much of this has already been taken in prerequisites. Um, so we have to remember our principles of adult learning and make sure it's applied for them so they really see where it's important. Um, and we have a patient-centered focus at UC Davis. When I was developing this curriculum, I had pretty much no budget, <laughs> um, zero budget, actually. Um, so when I joined the School of Nursing, um, there wasn't a lot of buy-in for doing anatomy labs or cadaver labs. I was also teaching in the gross anatomy course at the medical school and doing a lot of dissection with the medical program. And of course, you know, Having taught anatomy for years, I, I really felt that it was important to integrate um, anatomy learning in the cadaver lab into um, what we were learning into our medicine course. Um, for some physician assistant programs, it's very common for them to be in the lab. Um, for nurse practitioner programs, it's not common at all. Um, so I had no budget for developing lab sessions. Um, and I also had very limited time um, and a big class size, 85 students. Um, so it's not a small ask to develop lab sessions for a group of 85. But you can see actually that we're very well supported in our program for active learning. So um, this is us in the classroom doing a pathophysiology activity where we do a lot of small group and a lot of engaged active learning during our course. So the courses are run very well. It's just that we didn't have an, a lot of anatomy lab integrated into the course. So 
I wanted to make sure that it fit. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't too expensive. Um, and, I, and I also had to work on getting laboratory access for our courses. So my solution was instead of doing a, um, trying to get this program to develop a full new anatomy lab dissection program, my solution was to use a combination of virtual anatomy and small group lab sessions. So I began developing virtual anatomy um, virtual anatomy modules, um, currently using visible body for those, um, and to integrate them into the lab sessions. So we could have shorter periods of time in the lab, knowing that students were prepared for the lab with all of the resources and the visible body modules that we gave them before the lab. Um, so of course, in addition to that, I made sure to create some assessment and evaluation to see how the, the program was going. So. This is what the curriculum looks like now. We're in the fourth year of this curriculum. So what I did was I created um, a set of pre-recorded lectures and activities. The reason for the pre-recording of lectures and activities was that so we had flexibility to integrate this within the medicine course um, and to deliver them in an asynchronous manner so that students who had recently taken their anatomy prerequisites can zoom through them pretty quickly. Um, they just learned it maybe a couple of years ago, they're fresh out of undergrad, um, and they get through them pretty quick. Other students, some of our nurse practitioner students, some of our older PA students, it's been 15 years, sometimes 20 years since they've taken their prerequisite anatomy, and they might need to spend a little bit more time on the pre-recorded lectures and activities, go through them a little bit more slowly, um, really renewing their knowledge of anatomy. So I like the pre-recorded format for that. So I created those. I also created a laboratory guide with highlighted clinical applications, and I used both our anatomy and physiology textbooks and the virtual anatomy modules in visible body to create this lab guide. So basically what I do is I go through visible body. Um, I really like the anatomy and physiology modules in visible body. Um, the students can kind of self-pace through them, read them kind of like an interactive textbook, push through click through each of the anatomical structures and read as they go along. Um, and so what I'll do is I actually go through them myself. And as I'm going through them, I create a laboratory guide. And as I create that laboratory guide, um, it's just a Word document, really. It ends up being about 10 pages for each lab. Um, I also highlight clinical applications throughout. Um, so if you've all seen the Moore anatomy textbook that's really common in medical schools and PA schools, it's kind of similar to their blue box um, clinical application. So they go through some ana anatomical structures, and then we talk about why those anatomical structures are important clinically, some of the highlighted clinical applications. So as the students are reading their laboratory guide, they can read why these structures are important for their clinical study. At the end, after they've watched the lectures, read the guide, hopefully read the guide, <laughs> done the visible body modules, then I give them a quiz and we use Canvas, which I'm happy to talk to any of you all about how we integrated all of this in Canvas, but I create a quiz in Canvas for them to check their knowledge on the pre-lab assignments. So all of these I would consider to be preparation for the lab, getting their foundational knowledge down. And then I bring them into the lab at the end of that particular unit. Um, in that lab, we spend about an hour. We have small groups. I found that around a cadaver table, about 12 students is about the maximum number of students I'd like to have around the table. That's, you know, sort of fits well around. We can see all the structures that way and we're not too crowded. Of course, now with social distancing guidelines, that's gonna vary. Um, but we have about 12 students per hour, which means I guess if you guys do the math on a given day for these, I'm, I'm in the lab for about six hours straight. <laughs> um, that's okay, it's a tiring day for me, but uh, the students are only in there for an hour each. Uh, it's about an hour for the small group lab sessions. I rotate them through the lab. Um, and the way that I run these sessions is in a Q&A format. So being that these students are very experienced clinically, they have a lot to bring to the table. Um, many of them have, you know, 
five, 10, 20 years of clinical experience. So I love to ask them questions. You know, if we're looking at a particular structure, how many of you have seen this procedure related to this structure? How many of you have seen this in clinic? Um, so we really leave it very open, which means that each lab session can be a little bit different, but I have in my head an outline of what I want to make sure that we talk about during the lab session. Um, and they're really fun. So the students will chime in um, when I ask them questions. Um, and that my goal is that it's about 50-50, me talking, them talking, hopefully, hopefully less me, more them, um, because the more that they share, the more interesting it is for them. So we have a Q&A format. I'll go through some structures, ask them some questions about what they're learning in class, what they read, and clinical application. So we would consider this a faculty facilitated discussion of the clinical correlates of anatomy. Of course, if the students are really quiet, I have a presentation prepared that I will take them through um, if they don't have any additional things to add. So that's what I did. This is an example of what a lab session looks like. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of us in lab. Our lab doesn't allow um, images. Um, in the cadaver lab, but um, I borrowed this one from uh, Heidelberg University. They had a nice, nice picture um, of their instructor leading a lab session. So last week we did a pulmonary lab session. Um, it was about an hour um, and I outlined it in this way. I, I started with the bony landmarks with talking about the, the region of the thorax and what bony landmarks they see on the skeleton um, and also ask them what bony landmarks they're using on their patients. Um, so in this case, it was a nice opportunity for us to talk to them about what they're doing in their physical assessment course as they're learning to listen to the lungs, inspect the, the chest, um, watch a patient breathe. Um, I would ask them questions like, which, which ribs would you would you find if you wanted to listen to the middle lobe of the lung and on what side and ask them what they thought. Um, so I can use the bony landmarks to quiz them about surface anatomy and what they're learning in their physical assessment course. So I always start with bony landmarks. The next thing I do is then go to the, the donor and look at the chest wall and look at the muscles. Um, so we looked at the muscles of inspiration and expiration and we talked about things like Okay, let's, let's think about a barrel chest and when you would see um, the chest, uh, the diaphragm look more flattened. We talk about the diaphragm muscle and how it's innervated and, and why that might look different on a chest x-ray for a patient who say has a hyperinflation of the lungs because of COPD. Uh, so we quiz them on something like that. And the cool thing about being in the lab is that you know, we can actually have the students then feel the diaphragm look look under the diaphragm for the various landmarks they would be seeing on chest x-ray, go through it that way. So anyway, you guys get the point. Um, we do innervation and then much of this lab I spent on lung structure, um, talking them through the, the lower respiratory tract um, and all the things that they have been learning in class. And this is where it gets really fun because then we can start asking them about some of the patient conditions they've they've run into, questions that they might have that have come up in their primary care medicine lectures, anything like that. So that's a sample of a lab session. They are exhausting. We get a lot done in an hour because we have to maximize our time in the lab, um, but the students love them. They're really fun. So um, before I get into evaluation and assessment, I, I would love to open it up to any questions at this point about the curriculum that, that we've developed. Um, do we see any questions um, that anybody would like to ask? I'm happy to answer questions on the curriculum piece. Um, feel free to uh, use the raise hand button and uh, I will unmute you. Of course, if people are happily eating their lunch, <laughs> I will go through to evaluation and assessment. 
Any questions? Um, oh, actually, we do have a question in the chat. This was from Whitney. Um, if you have slash had no budget for the labs, are the students paying for the cost of the software? Whitney, that's a really great question. And that was a big concern for me as well. Um, it's one of the reasons we chose to go with visible body because it was a more economical option than some of the other options we've used in the past. Um, and what we ended up doing was using textbook funds um, for the purchase of that software. So it depends on your institution and it depends on how the funding source goes. But what we were able to do was work it out so that we replaced one of our textbooks with the visible body software. I worked with my administration to get that approved um, and we replaced what previously was a $90 textbook, 50 to $60 if they bought it used um, with visible body. So it was about the same cost as the textbook and we were able to have them use their textbook funds um, to purchase visible body. It, I will say that um, I always open it up at the beginning of class that when students, um, if I see that students haven't yet purchased the, the product that I will make sure and let them know that they should reach out to me if they're having difficulty being able to afford it. There may be some ways that we can get them support and financial aid um, in order to be able to support it. But because it's integrated and it's required, um, I've actually had only two students this year out of our 83 that told me um, they were choosing not to buy it um, and um, sharing with classmates instead. And, and, you know, that's not so bad. Okay, um, we actually have a hand raise, but um, uh, Jen, uh, you're gonna have to do this since you've got the... Uh, <laughs> Jen's got the controls. She's got the control, she's got the power. Oh, thank you very much. I'm muting for me. My, uh, my name is Dr. Akram. I'm, I'm, I'm talking from uh, London, Ontario. Uh, I teach anatomy in one of my orthopedics program, uh, but this program is not directly at the level of the medical graduates. This is the paramedics like with orthopedic technicians. Uh, so, Dr. Kara, the thing is that these days I am on um, the online system and for a long time we are using actual the real uh, textbook stuff but I am quite interested in this technology. So my question was only by that, that, but up till now, I have to go and fight tooth and nails with the administration to get these in. You know what I mean? I have to struggle very hard to get for every student and change with their curriculum. Straight away, my question is, is there any free version which I can use as an instructor to demonstrate while I am teaching online to my students? And I am also dependent upon paying the money to the, to the, to the, to the school. Uh, which sometimes schools are difficult to, uh, you know, to, to talk into. It's, I mean, I'll, I'll let the visible body team answer that as well, but I'll, I'll say from, from our side of things, um, what, one piece that has been really helpful is that our representative, um, Kara, who's here today, or two Karas, um, she actually was able to work with our library um, and our university library um, last year, um, partly because of COVID, but also partly because there were other um, departments that were interested in visible body. Our university library actually purchased visible body for access to all of our students. Um, so another way to go is to see if there are other departments um, interested in the software as well. And if there's a, a way for the library to receive a license for the software, then all of the students are able to access it um, for free. But so yeah, as you said, there there are two Kara's instant in in. Uh, in oh, I think we lost your. Oh no, uh, <laughs> no, his um mic was muted. Uh, so in in terms of of free software, I think the Visible Body team. You would you guys like to answer that question? Um, Kara with a K. Do you want to take that one? Yes, I would be happy to. So we can always work with libraries to start a free trial. And then um, we do offer access to the apps themselves or also courseware. And we have a variety of different pricing options. So 
if you're interested, I encourage you to, you can say something in the chat here and I can connect you with your rep if it's not me, <laughs> or um, we can always, um, you know, I mean, we can have reps reach out to you as well. So yes, just I'm let us know. Any other questions? Uh, I'm typing my email address here, Kara. So perhaps we can connect. Uh, this is my email address, yes, Akram at uh, Wester. Perfect. We'll get someone in touch with you. Yes, thank you very much. You're very glad. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, the, the cost piece is really important. We, we can't do these things if the students don't have access. So thank you for your questions. Okay, I'll do a bit on how we've decided to evaluate and assess this curriculum and then I'm happy to open up to any other questions as, as you all think of them. Um, so whenever we have new technology in the classroom or new curriculum, it's very important to us to make sure that we evaluate how the introduction of, of those resources are going and also um, how the students are doing um, curriculum wise. So we looked at course evaluations um, together with my teaching fellow. I also developed a survey specifically related um, to the new anatomy curriculum. Um, and we also collected um, qualitative data, student comments um, on the new curriculum sessions. Of course, we can always do more. Um, so I, I will definitely do more in the future. So if we look at the survey, um, we looked at overall perceptions of the anatomy lab. This is one section of our survey. This is the overall I'm satisfied question, which we know from evaluations is not always the greatest question, but we should ask it. Um, more importantly, we asked, would you recommend this type of anatomy lab to other students? And did you think your experience in the anatomy lab sessions was worthwhile? We have a very impacted curriculum. So we wanted to know, did you think that this was, was worth your time? Um, so you can see the distribution of the data. We had 50 students out of our 80 something respond to this particular survey. Um, and they very much agreed with all of these statements. I also really wanted to know, was it relevant and engaging for the students? This is a different way to run anatomy labs. Um, so um, my teaching fellow and I developed some questions specifically related to that. So we wanted to know, did you find the sessions to be informative and interesting? Um, did you have an opportunity to participate and ask questions? That's really my goal as an instructor to make sure they're getting what they need. I also asked, are you going to apply this to your future clinical practice? Um, this is a different way of teaching anatomy, and I wanted to make sure that they thought it was useful as future clinicians. And then finally, we asked um, whether they thought they would apply it to their current course work. I wanted to make sure that the clinical correlates we developed and discussed were related um, to their primary medicine course. Um, again, uh, they all did. They, well, there was one student who disagreed, <laughs> but the rest, there's always that one. It's not a real survey if there's not one grumpy student, right? <laughs> but the good majority of the students, 96, 94, 96% of the students agreed that they were clinically relevant and engaging based on these measures. So we got some really nice survey data back. And I will also say just, you know, qualitatively, the students absolutely love these sessions. Um, the number one feedback we got from our course evaluations was that they wanted more of them. <laughs> so more, longer, longer time in the lab, more lab sessions. We, we love it. It's one of their favorite parts of the course, which gives us then the data to go back to administration and say, hey, this is great. Let's do more. Um, I want to read to you a couple of the student comments um, because it helps to see how this all tied together. So here's one of the student comments. It is so helpful to see what the organs and vessels really look like after covering them in lecture. The explanations in lab are very thorough and impressionable. The most helpful tool is the pre-lab. It allows proper preparation and has really helped piece all the information from the lectures and cases together. So I think this is where both the lab handouts and the visible body modules really came together to help the students really get engaged in lab and, and make the best use of their time. Um, here's another one. 
Being able to see firsthand that, ana the, that anatomy and applying the concepts in class while having the vast knowledge of the instructor is a far greater learning experience than a YouTube video or a textbook. Well, guys, if we beat YouTube, I think we've done our jobs. <laughs> um, so that makes me happy. If students are not going to YouTube, then I know I've given them what they needed. Um, and then the last one, these past few anatomy labs have been so vital in applying what we are learning in the classroom to a real life tangible example. When learning about certain body parts that I have never seen up close, I have gained such a greater understanding of its anatomy and physiology as I get the chance to palpate, hold it, and inspect it, inspect it up close. It's a great hands-on lesson. So they really enjoyed these labs, even though they were very short. Um, this curriculum is working really well for our students. And partly, I think, because of the preparation um, and the work that goes into um, putting the whole picture together. So, OK, that is it. Um, some acknowledgments. Um, there is my email. I'm very happy to share curriculum. I love sharing curriculum with other instructors. Um, if you guys would like to see any of the handouts or quizzes or anything that we created, happy to share. Um, please feel to please feel free to reach out to me, and I'll I'll take any any other questions. So I see that Jacob is asking about, um, would it be comprehensive for undergraduate level coursework without the anatomy lab? Um, Jacob, it depends on how you integrate it in with the overall coursework. Um, I think the important piece is putting the whole picture together. So last year during COVID, um, our lab was closed. Um, so we couldn't go into the cadaver lab. So all we had um, was our online lectures, um, our activities and our visible body along with the quizzes. Um, students did very well um, with that, um, but I will say they missed the hands-on. So if there's an opportunity without donors to create some hands-on sessions in a different way. So for example, we also do a heart dissection um, we also do an eye dissection. Those are relatively inexpensive hands-on activities where the students, you know, for example, our eye lab is super fun. So um, we, we dissect eyes, um, cow eyes or sheep eyes, um, and um, we run them in the same way that we run the cadaver lab where it's an hour long session. We talk about the clinical correlates and, um, you know, for 80 students to get, you know, eyes to dissect for 80 students, it's, you know, they're, they're a couple dollars a piece. So, so relatively um, budget friendly. Yeah. Yeah, brain, heart, eyes. And yeah, so Jacob, let me know. I can send you my heart and my eye dissection labs. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm not able to, let's see. So uh, we just have a comment from uh, Jennifer Ellsworth. Hi, Jennifer. Um, your students are so articulate. This helps me to see the development from the undergraduate to the graduate level. Well, that's great to hear, Jennifer. Yeah, we have a good group. The average age of our students is 24. Um, and they come to us with a lot of clinical experience. We have a minimum clinical experience entering our program of a thousand hours, but many of them have many, many more years of clinical experience before they come to us. It's a nice group. Uh, we have one from Florence. Uh, how much of the positive comments referred to um, visible body versus the cadaver labs? Ah, so they 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 were so excited about the lab. So all of this is about cadaver lab, cadaver lab, cadaver lab, right? Um, they you know the visible body and the the stuff they do prior to the lab sneaks in there, right? They don't think about what they're watching and reading. And, um, but that's a great question, Florence. And actually just today, I sent out a survey on resource utilization. So we have a curriculum and technology team at UC Davis that um, we really evaluate when we have new technologies. Um, so actually just today, I sent out a survey to the students specifically asking about the new resources that we're using, including visible body. So, okay, you guys will have to invite me back and I'll <laughs> <laughs> 
specifically about visible body. And if you'd like to see that evaluation that we developed for visible body, um, we did it in the context of other resources that they're using, um, because I don't think you can just ask about visible body without asking things like, well, do you tend to use the textbooks? Do you tend to use other media resources? How do you feel about technology? So we did actually ask specifically about those things as well. So, yeah. By the way, I use Qualtrics for my surveys. I don't know what you all are using to survey your students. Um, I like to create my own in Qualtrics so that we can tailor those surveys to you know, what we wanna know. Uh, we have another, uh, we have a question from uh, Jennifer this time. Um, do you use the visible body testing tool? I am not using the visible body testing tool. I'm sorry, Kara, cover your ears. <laughs> we made the choice. You're killing me, Kara, killing me. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, and we actually, we use other technologies in the classroom and we do the same thing. So we also use um, osmosis and some other technologies. Um, we choose actually to do Canvas quizzes um, specifically for the visible body because we have so many different technologies that our students are using to ask them to go and take quizzes on all of the different pieces that we're using. Just in terms of cognitive load, we decided that our quizzing will be in Canvas. Um, but I do use the visible body courseware modules and specifically refer to them in their Canvas quizzes. So I'll say, you know, this structure, you know, in chapter 23, point to it, ask them a question about it. So they actually should have their visible body modules open um, as they're taking those quizzes and, and reviewing. So no, we made the decision to do Canvas quizzes so that it all gets integrated and students have just one place um, for their quizzes. So sorry, Kara. <laughs> I do like them. I think the quizzes are great. We just, in terms of grading, have chosen to put it into Canvas. Yeah. Okay. Um, I apologize. I am going to pronounce this incorrectly. Um, is it Sergey or Sergey? Sorry. Is there any way for you to demonstrate what the students see? Oh, demonstrate um, what they see in um, visible body. So Sergey, are you asking about for visible body to show what the modules look like? Uh, Jen, do you want to unmute his, uh, his mic? Sure. Serge. Yes, hi. hi. No, I was Sorry. Just, okay. Every listen, you did you didn't do do, do as bad as some people do. Uh, <laughs> for some reason it's a it's a it's a pretty straightforward name, but you know, people like maybe it's too simple. Um but anyway, no, I was just curious, what is there any way for us in the audience to see what the student sees when they're doing a virtual dissection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will leave that to the visible body team. Would you guys like to show them um, virtual dissection or will they have future webinars where they can view that? Sure. Um, let me open up my courseware and, and go into... I've got oh. it open, Courtney. Oh, good. Know. Then... If you want me to share, I can. I don't Absolutely. know if there's anything in particular that you want me to, um, Kara, maybe if there's stuff that you want me to particularly um, highlight. Let's see if I can get to the right screen here. So Serge, I'll tell you that um, we there's many different apps for visible body. So it depends on what you need for your courses. Um, what we use in our course is the anatomy and physiology app the most. Um, but if you want to look at dissection, um, then that would be the human anatomy atlas. So Kara, if you want to show them the, the anatomy and physiology, um, and he's interested in skeletal muscles, we could pull open the skeletal muscle part. Sure. Um, what I like about the anatomy and physiology app is that it's, it's 
very easy for the students to go one by one through the structures. They're already labeled, so I don't have to go in and create a bunch of new labels myself. I have very little time and bandwidth for <laughs> creating things from, from zero. Um, these are already prepackaged. Um, so, you know, let's see, Kara, if you click on the axial and appendicular skeleton, that one would be good. So um, when you look at it on the left-hand side, you'll see they can read the description and they can click on a structure and the structure gets highlighted in blue. And then they can read more about the structure if they pull down the drop-down menu. So to me, the anatomy and physiology modules feel kind of like an interactive textbook where they can really click through the structures, read about them and go through and, and advance forward. And I will select out the pieces that I want them to use in the modules that I create in Visible Body. And that way they don't have to click through everything. Um, but this way it's, it's already labeled for me. I don't have to create the labels, which I've had to do with other programs and I, I don't have the time. Serge, does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I'm, am I still unmuted? No, we hear you. We can oh, hear you. Yes, very much. Thank you so much. It looks very, very easy to navigate. Very, very, very nice. Yeah, this yeah. is. So this is the A&P app. We also have our Human Anatomy Atlas app, which is, um, clearly I haven't launched into this in a little while, have I? Um, so from here, you can look at the regional views, for instance, if you wanted to go into the thorax, and you can also go into the systems view. But the nice thing here, and let's just go into one of these skeletal views here. The nice thing here is you're starting off with that image there. You can zoom and rotate. Anything you select is going to give you, it's going to pop up in that box, and you get the same, you know, the option to read a little definition. Um, uh, you can get the pronunciation, which I will say this is the one thing the students always say, oh, God, I'm so glad you have that, because then I can ask a question without fearing that I sound like a complete idiot, because <laughs> some of the terms are pretty hard, especially for the students. Um, you can also layer different systems on and off with the systems tray, and I know that a lot of instructors use this if they're trying to show, you know, specific um, you know, lungs, whatever, how they're, you know, like how the different systems are functioning. So I could layer on, you know, integumentary, I could layer on muscles, you know, whatever I want to do, I can kind of layer them on here oh, and wow. layer them off the same way. That's fantastic. Yeah. And you, you can label them and create special views to send to your students, mm -hmm. um, which I would love to do when I get to take a sabbatical and create all of these things. <laughs> um, but it does take a lot of time to create those views and save them. So I haven't, I haven't done that myself much. We can help with that. And we also do have a couple of preset views on our website. I'm sure Courtney <laughs> could tell you how yes, many we have. Um, so we've uh, got them all preloaded. We've got a bunch of pre-built tours and stuff. And you can take those and kind of adapt them if you don't want to start from, you know, ground zero, so to speak. Yeah, uh, we have um, a tour function um, in Atlas uh, that kind of links these 3D views together. So you can download, uh, say a tour on um, skeletal muscles or um, you know anything that we might have and you can use it as is and have students kind of page through these different views and interact with um, the different models or you can customize them you know, to be whatever it is that you want them to be. Um, we also have, um, for uh, our courseware app, which kind of takes all of um, our apps and, and puts them into uh, a learning management system. We have tons of preset courses that you can download and you know we have assignments built in. So you can also use the models in there as well. These are just a couple of the pre-built courses we have. We have many more than this. This is a mess of a dashboard, but and then um, the question in quiz bank that people were talking about are accessed here. We have about, I don't even know how many, we always kept saying over 3,500, but I swear it's probably more like over 5,000 now with everything they've added in. But um, multiple choice and uh, dissection. Um, 
For those of you who are on Canvas, we are working on a deep integration. So that would allow these to feed to your grade book. So Kara, you now have no more excuses. <laughs> as, soon as, it, as soon as it integrates with the Canvas grade book. I know, I'm just giving you our time. <laughs> we're in. Any other questions? Oh, Jacob is asking, um, what textbook do we use? So we, you know, as I said, to be able to give the students the budget to purchase a visible body, we, we moved one of our textbooks from required to recommended. So if they're not finding what they need in visible body um, and in the lab handouts that we create, um, they have two primary textbooks. Um, one is their pathophysiology textbook, um, which is McCanson Huther. Um, the McCanson Huther textbook has structure function chapters to each of their pathophys chapters. So McCants is one of the primary textbooks that we use in our clinical courses. The, the other textbook is the more clinical anatomy textbook. There's an essentials version, which is a short version of the more clinical anatomy. And then there's the, the large version of the more clinical anatomy textbook that's the most common used in medical schools and PA schools and nurse practitioner schools when, when they require them. So the more clinical anatomy is our Bible of clinical anatomy as many of you probably probably use, yeah. And, uh, and I will say that um, we do have a courseware course that correlates to, um, to the Moors. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, and Jennifer um, Ellsworth uh, chimed in in the chat to say that um, Visible Body also works well with um, Rick Martini's Visual Anatomy and Physiology textbook. And I do believe that we have a Martini correlated course for courseware as well. Um, so we have a question from Katie. Um, my library pays for a subscription to the Human Anatomy Atlas 2017 version. I'm trying to make things more interactive and uh, utilize the Atlas more with my students. Is the Courseware app an additional cost? So I'm gonna let Kara uh, with a K actually answer that question. Cost, you can either um, pass it on to the students or we do have um, institutional pricing as well. The nice thing about courseware is that it includes access to all of the apps um, and the students do still get the mobile download, which is great for studying on the go, um, but it also is going to integrate all that quizzing and other stuff that we talked about for, um, you know, like assignability and stuff. I can have your rep get in contact with you, Katie, if you want some options. And yeah, Kim is asking about the pre-built information. So um, in, in our case, um, I just talked to our rep about the textbooks that we were using and Kara is our rep and she sent them to me, linked them in my courses in courseware and I was able to go through them and choose the ones that, that I thought were helpful and modify and, and build off of those. So the, they, the visible body team can load them in for you, right, Kara? Yes, so we can definitely do that. I did wanna point out, if you go to your My Courses page and you click on this pre-made courses link in the top right-hand corner, we've got some of them on this link, but I will say that this is not all of them. So you can kind of look by what you're teaching here. Um, this is not all of them though. So your best bet is to, um, you know, reach out to your rep, or if you want to, um, comment here or say it here, I can definitely reach out and have them send it to you as well. Cause like I said, this is not all of them. This is probably only not even a quarter of the ones we have, I would guess. <laughs> so yeah, we definitely have more, but that's where you could check that pre-made courses link. Or like I said, it's probably, probably faster just to let us know which ones you have and we can send it to you. So Jacob is asking about the, time. the timeline for deep integration for Canvas. Yes, that is in the works right now. We are hoping to have it for spring term is the last I heard. Jennifer, if you have any other updates, let me know. But that's the last that I've, that I've been told on that one. Yeah, 
Right, that, that, that is the latest I've heard too. Okay. Um, uh, there was another question uh, from Jacob. Is there an integrated course for that pathophysiology book that Dr. Sandholt mentioned? Um, we and, can't. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say that Jacob, it's um, because it's a systems based um, pathophysiology textbook, it's going to be very similar to any of the other systems based um, textbook. So you don't necessarily have to have the one specifically for McCants. If it's systems-based, it's kind of in, in a similar order. Yeah. But yeah, I think, Kara, I think they did. Yeah. What was the name of the book that you used, Kara? I missed that. McCann? And I just it. McCann? There. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I can send that to you, Jacob. Or I'll have your rep. I think your rep is Rob. <laughs> Jacob, yep. never apologize for questions. Yeah, questions no worries, are, Jacob. I actually already reached out to um, your rep. It should be Rob Kneebone, and he'll get in touch with you, which I always think is the most convenient name for working at Visible Body. This is the actual last name. Last name. So. I don't understand how you could time it so, I mean, how you could make that so perfect. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been joking with him about it for the last 10 years. So it is, it's the perfect last name That's to work here. Thing. Um. So uh, there was a question, I just lost it, oh, uh, from Serge. Um, am I correct in assuming uh, that the visible body is strictly for clinical anatomy and does not include physiology? Um, we we actually definitely have, have physiology. physiology. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney, sorry. <laughs> no, um, we have a lot of um, physiology content in um, ac across uh, a few of our apps. We have... Um, we have uh, physiology and pathology, which is um, one of our newer apps. So that um, basically combines normal anatomy and physiology with common conditions, diseases, and, um, and 3D models of uh, some of those common conditions that students can then kind of compare with the normal anatomy. It's, uh, it's very cool. And, uh, and grotesque in a lot of ways when you look at things like polycystic, you know, kidneys and, um, you know, uh, tuberculosis in the lungs. Um, but it's, it's really compelling and uh, probably my favorite app. But um, uh, I'm actually gonna be sending everybody a follow-up email to this um, tomorrow morning. And I'm going to include a, a, a special kind of uh, webpage that we have that has a bunch of our physiology content on it that you can check out, um, but we, we do have a lot, so. Um, and we use it because our course is integrated anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, so it's one of the reasons we like the A and P app for Visible Body because it has nice little physiology videos kind of in between the anatomy modules, um, which are really nicely done videos. And sometimes they're introductions, sometimes they're partway through. So, you know, for example, for the respiratory system, they have um, inspiration and expiration and um, that kind of physiology videos are integrated through. Um, and that's, it's nice to, to put those together if you're teaching a combined course, yeah, which we are. Um, Sarfraz, um, Chantal, uh, will probably forward you to your rep, who I actually believe, um, is Matt Smars, uh, since I no, think it's, it's actually, on. it's actually Megan, but Chantal's going to feed it first. It's oh, going to feel it first. I, yep. That was Canada. Um, uh, so you, you will be forwarded to the right person. Um, and we have one from Margaret. Will you ever put all of the histology slides in one place? It would be easier to navigate. That is a really good question that I can pass on to our, um, our development team as a, you know, uh, an improvement that, um, that we might be able to do down the, uh, down the road. As of right now, um, all of those slides are uh, set up by system. So, but having them all in one place, I think you might be onto something. So I will definitely pass that along. Actually, I'm going to write it down so I don't forget. Mm -hmm. I've got it if that's okay. Awesome.
both options <laughs> both options would be nice. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Do I get a raise for that? I'll have to talk to the team about that, Margaret. <laughs> um, all right, we have uh, about eight minutes left. So um, does that, does anybody have any any other questions about anything? Well, it's very nice to meet you all. I'm glad we got a chance to share our curriculum. Um, and as I said, please, please do feel free to, to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, Margaret, I haven't used the cadaver views. Um, you know, if we were extending and if our anatomy lab had stayed closed again this year, um, I would certainly have considered adding it. Um, but we got really lucky and we're able to get back into the lab um, in small groups. So not yet. Uh, there was another one um, from Linda. Is there a course for neuroanatomy and neurophysiology? So I know that we have some pre-made courses. I'm pretty that... sure there there are a few books, Linda. If you want, I can um, um, I can get your rep in contact with you to to talk about some of those. I know that we have, um, and I'm probably going to pronounce the same wrong <laughs> as well. Um, I think it's Cycle, um, S E I K E L. Um, it's anatomy and physiology for, um, for speech, language, and hearing, I think. And um, we have a correlation for that, but we can also build a course for, for whatever it is that you need. So we'll have somebody reach out to you, Linda. Writing that one down too. Yeah, I have it down too, Courtney, so. <laughs> awesome, everybody is so far ahead of me. Okay. All right, we have six minutes left. So uh, I would say if you have any <laughs> final <laughs> burning questions that you need to have answered, now is the time. But also um, in the follow-up email that I'm gonna be sending, I will, um, I'll give you some email addresses that you can um, contact, including uh, Dr. Sandholt. If you have any questions that crop up in the middle of the night that you wish that you had asked uh, now, you can always reach out to us no matter when um, or about, you know, whatever topic we are here for you. Okay, I think I think we can bring that to a uh, to a swift close. So, um, <laughs> from Margaret, my rep reached out to me during an App State football game. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but thank you all for joining us um, this afternoon, and a special thank you to uh, Dr. Sandholt. Um, this was an amazing presentation, and you guys had.